Thank you for joining me. Grayboard Gamer here with my next playthrough series. This time I'm playing Freedom, the Underground Railroad, designed by Brian Mayer and from Academy Games. Let's get the box open and get it set up. As you can see, the game board is quite large. It's got quite a large footprint. I was able to get almost all of it. The only part that we're missing is these little corners down here. So you'll have some of the cards cut off. And then I'll have my player mats here too, where you may not be able to see a few things. But as always, I'll zoom in or concentrate on the section of the player card or game board where the action is happening at that time. The first thing we're going to do is select our characters or our conductors for the Underground Railroad. There are six to choose from. I'm going to play this as a two-player game. and I'm going to do this randomly. All right, I'm just going to cut the cards, whatever's on top. So I'll take the agent and the stockholder. We have the stockholder and the agent. We need to get to both of their player cards. Here's the one for the agent and I need to get one for the stockholder. The cards for our protagonists here, they have a really nice order of play on each of them that helps you keep track of what you need to do. And then you can see there's a spot for a roll card and a reserve card. This is their roll card. It's going to start on the side that has the Roman numeral 1 at the top because it has a special ability on it that you can use once per game. Once you use it, you flip it over and it's not there any longer. Also on some of the cards, you can see here he gets plus one during the action phase, or plus one dollar, and moves two slaves one space each during the action phase. Once he uses that ability, he still gets one dollar during the action phase, but now he can only move one slave one space during the action, action phase. So his ability is useful and powerful, but when you use it, his ability to help people move around is less than it was before. And I can see that I'm not going to be able to see the bottom of these cards. So instead of putting the roll card down here off frame, I'm going to place it right next to the card. That way we can see that it's there and which side it's on. And the same thing for our stockholder. His Ability is he also gets a dollar during the action phase and then once per action phase purchase a token After taking a fundraising action that'll make sense in just a little while and his special one-time use during your action phase Spend three tokens so you can stockpile tokens and Then use them instead of only using two he can use three Just one time though Next, you see these three locations at the bottom of the board here in the south that have the light and darkened cubes. Those are the three plantations, and these spaces represent where you're going to put slaves, which is what these cubes represent during the game. During the setup, you're going to place one slave on each of the light cubes. You're not going to put it on the darkened ones. Those are for later use or if you want to play a more difficult variant of the game you can fill those up also at the beginning. But we're going to play the normal normal variant so we'll fill the lighter spaces with cubes that represent slaves. 
Then we'll set up the slave market cards and you use eight of these according to how many players are playing the game. This is a two-player game. I've already separated them, but any card that says two players on it, which are the eight that I have on top, are the ones we're going to use in the game. The rest of these will get discarded off to the side for now. So we take our eight slave market cards. We're going to give them a shuffle. Then we're going to place them here on the market space. Then we're going to draw the top three cards. Let me show you what one looks like here. And we will put cubes or slaves on each of these spaces and these represent the different slave markets and the slaves that are for sale in those markets. So we'll put the top three out. Pardon my strange reach, I'm trying to stay out of frame at the same time or stay out as much as possible. So we have a market with five, a market with seven, and then a market with six. And I'll go ahead and put cubes on there to represent the slaves that are in those markets. Now we will set up the abolitionist decks according to time period. And you can see on the board here that there are three time periods, 1800 to 1839, 1840 to 1859, and then 1860 to 1865. And just like the slave market cards, if you're playing a one or two player game, you're going to remove all of these cards that have the three and four player designator on them. So those will get taken out of the decks and placed off to the side and not use this game. And the ones that are for one and two or three and four players, they have no indicators on them at all on this on these decks. Each of these decks with their specific time period are going to go on their time period space. We'll shuffle these again in just a moment. And you'll notice you have several of these types of cards. And then we have these ones that are the white border and these are the reserve cards and they'll say on here play from your reserve. If we purchase these cards in the future you can barely see down here at the bottom maybe a little bit easier here on the stockholder. Next to the roll card space right here there's a spot for a reserve card. You can have one reserve card in your hand or on your player board at any given time. Into these decks, you have the orange opposition cards. And these are things that cause negative effects during the gameplay. And according to the rule book for a one player or one or two player game, you're going to take three, you're going to deal three of these into our first time period, four here, and three here. So we'll take three, let me switch hands, so we have three, four, and three. The remaining cards are out of the game. And now what I'll do is I'll shuffle these really well in their respective piles to create our draw decks for those time periods. To form the abolitionist queue, we're going to draw the first five cards from our first column, which is the only active time period at the beginning of the game. We got Liberty Hill, which allows us to move two slaves, one space each, and purchase a token at full cost. That will make sense 
All of these will make sense later as you learn the gameplay. Theodore Weld, move one slave from any plantation to a southern space with no effect. Lane Theological Seminary. Move two slaves one space each or purchase a token at a $2 discount. St. Catharines, Ontario. Move one slave from a large northern city to Canada. And finally, John Greenleaf Whittier. Exchange the position of two cards in the abolitionist queue. Well, we didn't draw any of the opposition cards or reserve cards here at the beginning. And if you can see at the top of these cards on the board are dollar values, three, two, two, one, and one, and that's the cost to purchase those cards. And these types of cards take effect as soon as you purchase them. Here we have the victory condition boards according to how many people are playing the game. We're playing the two-player game. So in order to meet one of our victory conditions, we have to free 10 slaves, which means get them to Canada. And you can see there are 16 squares that represent slaves that are lost. If at any time during the game, we have all 16 of these filled, and we have to place another one over here, and we can't because they're all filled, all filled, then we lose the game. And this board, there's a space for it in the upper right corner here, which is where it'll go. Each player starts the game with eight dollars, which is represented by these currency tokens that come with the game. And I'll put these off to the side so you can see them. I think there's some room. Yeah, I'll put the currency right here to the left of the roll cards so we know how much each money each player has. Here we have the gray conductor tokens and they are according to time period and you can see it next to one of the other ones that this one is gray in color. The gray ones go down first on the appropriate spaces in each time period so we'll have one for each of these spaces that I'll put down also. With the gray tokens down, we'll now place the tokens on these other round spots in each of the time period columns, and that's done according to this chart. We're in a two-player game, so in each time period, it tells you for support tokens, there'll be two, three, and two. Conductor tokens will be five, and then since there's two, you can see right here there's two in each of these next two time periods. There'll be three of each type there, two of each type there, and finally the fundraising tokens, there'll be two, three, and two respectively. And let me show you what those are. The, let me grab this here real quick, and these are the support tokens. They're the same on both sides. And I'll place those up here on the support token area. I placed the support tokens and then I placed the additional conductor tokens as specified in the chart. And like the chart will say 5, 3, 3, 2, and 2 for the conductor tokens. Those numbers on the chart do include the gray token that's already there. So this spot called for five. There was already a gray token there, so I put four more on. Next, I have to put down the fundraising tokens, which in a two-player game will be uh, two, three, and two. And those look like they have the coin on one side 
and then the fundraising amount, not the amount, but the color, which I'll explain during the gameplay. And it shows that if you have a slave on that color, when you use this token, it'll give you one dollar. I'll go ahead and place those on their spaces. And those fundraising tokens are in place. Those represent funds that people that are supportive to our cause of getting slaves through the Underground Railroad and freed up north. That's where those funds are coming from, or people that are supporting our cause. These are the five slave catcher tokens. They represent the people, kind of like bounty hunters that would go across the country to hunt down escaped southern slaves to bring back to their masters in the south. And these will start on the spaces indicated. For example, this orange dot or orange circle will be here in Chicago to start the game because that's where the orange indicator is on the game board. And the yellow triangle starts in Rochester. The square or brown square begins in New York. Purple oval, Washington DC, and the blue pentagon in Detroit. This lantern token will go to the first player for the turn. And I'll use this extra coin that I'm not using, or extra fundraising token, and we'll call this side heads and this side tails. If it's heads, we start with the agent, tails with the stockholder. Heads. So the agent will be our, let me put this where we can see it, our first player. The game is set up and it's ready to go. And I'll be using this wonderful reference card to provide two of them in the game that steps you through each phase of the game, goes over a lot of the rules, all condensed onto this card. Rarely do I have to go into the rule book to look anything up. This is a really, really good tool. Very nice that that was included makes the game flow a lot easier. With all that said, we're ready to start. We're going to try to get at least 10 slaves, according to our goal, into Canada. And we also have to meet another victory condition besides freeing a minimum of 10 slaves. These support tokens that you see up here and they have a cost above them of $10. And just the same, the conductor tokens have a cost above them, starting with two here, three here, three here, four and four. And the fundraising tokens have no cost. But the support tokens, you have to purchase them all before the end of the eighth turn. And there are eight cards over here, and you'll see that that works as our timer because at the end of the round, the bottom card gets emptied, it comes out of the game, these two will move down, and then the next one will get flipped over. So by the time that is empty, which would be the eighth card would be right here, before the end of that eighth turn, we have to have freed a minimum of 10 slaves and purchased all of these support tokens here, which represent support for um, ending slavery. And we start in this column here. And we cannot advance to the next one until these support tokens up here are purchased. As soon as we purchase those two, it'll unlock the next column. As soon as we purchase these three, it'll unlock the next column. And you cannot make purchases from other columns going this way until you've purchased all the support tokens here. 
for example, if we purchase all these, it'll unlock this column and then we can make purchases from both columns at that time and then when we unlock the third one, we can make purchases from everything. The first thing we'll do at the beginning of the round is the slave catcher phase. We're going to roll these two dice together. And if one of the slave catcher symbols comes up, we will move it in the direction indicated by the arrows and the number of arrows. For example, two white arrows, three white, three black, one black, so on. If we happen to roll this symbol, that means we're able to move about freely and the slave catchers do not move according to this die this round. They'll just sit still here in the uh, slave catcher phase. They will move during the gameplay and you'll see how that happens, but they won't move in this initial phase. So the first thing we're going to do is roll both of these. And the yellow triangle will move along the black direction two spaces. And you can see our slave catcher here represented by the yellow triangle and you can see that there's a black arrow going along its path which is represented by the yellow path this direction or the white arrow that direction. So we rolled the yellow triangle with two black arrows so it's going to go he's going to go this way. He got a a tip that there may be some runaway slaves here. So he's going to move two spaces. One, two, and he'll end up there at the beginning of our first round. If the slave tracker at any time during the game ends their movement on the same space as one of the escaped slaves, that escaped slave will get sent back to the market and then eventually will end up back in the plantation or worst case scenario end up as a, a lost slave going towards our losing condition. And again that's if they end up in a spot with the slave. If they pass over a spot, like if they, they remove two, if he passed through a spot that had a slave on it and then moved on, that slave was okay. They successfully either hid or were or hidden by supporters of the Underground Railroad and that slave catcher passed by uneventful. So they have to end their move in the spot in order to catch the slave and send them back to the market. Next we're in the planning phase. That's the second uh, phase in, in a round. And just a reminder of his special ability, we're not going to use it right now, but during the planning phase, remove one slave from each of the slave market deliveries currently on the board and return them to the supply. And what that means is I would take one cube off of each of these markets and put them back into the supply, meaning that there's one less slave in each of those markets at that time, which is a huge advantage later in the game if things get tight, so we'll save that for later because I don't want to use it right away because during his action phase he can move two slaves one space each during the action phase and as soon as I use that ability he goes down to only being able to move one. I don't want that to be taken away, his ability to move two to be taken away early in the game. We're in the planning phase which means we can take two tokens or we can get two tokens, you have to purchase them from the current or current time periods. I have to kind of plan what I want to do because if I purchase conductor tokens and right now they're two dollars, it allows me to move three slaves one each and that has to be three different. I can't just pick one and move one, two, three spaces. It has to be three different spaces, or three different slaves, and they have to move only one each. And don't forget he has the, on his action, he's going to also move two one space each. Or I could purchase a fundraising token, 
and I, I say purchase, but these don't have a value. You don't have to pay for them. You can take them for free. And what that means, oh, let me pick that up again. It shows a picture of a slave on a green space. If you look on the board here in the south, these ovals are all green, including the cities down here in the south. Well, not all of them. Some of them are not green. But if you have that token and you play it during the action phase, every one of those spaces that's green, that has a slave on it, will give you a dollar in support. It sounds like you could just pack a bunch of cubes, a bunch of slaves into these beginning areas and make a bunch of money initially. Well, that's not the case because each space can only have one slave on it, except for the big cities that have the squares around them. They can have up to four slaves in those cities. But all these other spaces, the small cities or just the plain ovals, can only have one slave on them. Now you could have a slave here, and if you have something that allows you to move one slave twice, you can pass through a location that has a slave on it, but you can't stop your or end your move and have two of them in one spot. And that makes sense because the more you have in one location, the easier chance there is of you being caught. So that makes sense that they'd want to spread you out and make it a high possibility of you succeeding in your escape to the north. I don't have enough money right now to purchase a support token, so I'm going to have to raise funds. I start with eight. I'm going to purchase one of the conductor tokens for two. And like I said, you can, have, you can get up to two tokens in the planning phase. And I have to decide, do I want to get another conductor token or do I want to get a fundraising token? I think I'm going to take the approach of getting as many people moving as possible, so I'll spend another two to get another conductor token for the agent. And that'll end his planning phase. And now we move over to the stockholder. And for the stockholder, I'm going to spend two to get a conductor token. And then I'm going to take a fundraising token for free for his second choice. And the reason I'm doing that is his regular ability, once per action phase, which is coming up next, purchase a token after taking a fundraising action. So I'm hoping I can move enough of my slaves off of these plantations on their way north, get plenty of them in the green spaces, and then I could take that fundraising action, make enough money to be able to uh, purchase a token after taking that action, which means if I can get up to 10, I can go ahead and purchase one of the support tokens here in the first round. And as you can see, there's two, three, two. So we have seven of them we have to purchase. So we have to move quickly. We have to get these slaves to freedom. We have to get enough money so we can gain the support we need to overturn and abolish this horrible practice of slavery in America early American history here. The planning phase is complete. Now we're going to move into the action phase. And things get a little more complex here. Because there are several actions you can do. And as you can see it says the player may take any or all of the following actions in any order. You can play a conductor or fundraising token. You can play a second conductor or fundraising token so you can play up to two. Buy and resolve one abolitionist card. That's the abolitionist cards down here. You can buy one of those during your turn. Gain the benefit of the player's roll card, which we will do, and I'll show you that in just a moment. And use the roll card's one-time special ability. If you don't want to do any of these, you can pass the action phase and gain money from the bank. 
depending on the time period, that would be three, four, or five dollars. Now we start the action phase here and our agent gets one dollar during the action phase. And again, he can move two slaves one space each during the action phase. So we'll get his we'll get his dollar there. I gained my dollar. And before I move let's see move two slaves one space each during the action phase. So I want to get things started here. These circles here are just the pictures of the plantation. That's not the first move you make. That just represents the plantation. So the first move you would make would be along one of these paths to the first green space here in the south. Now I want to make room in these plantations because what will happen at the end of the turn during the slave market phase is the lowest card here. All of those slaves will get moved to the plantation. And if there's not enough space at the plantation, and we can use these brown spots now, if there's not enough space here, every slave that is not able to go to the plantation goes to our slaves lost and puts us steps closer to losing the game. When we're making our movements, we also have to keep in mind the slave catchers that are out there, the five of them. And from this far away shot, you can probably see that there's different colored paths for them, which I showed you for the yellow when the yellow slave catcher moved to the north, according to the dice that we rolled. Also, if you end your move, if any slave ends their move on a space that's connected to one of those trails, either one or more slave catcher trails, that slave catcher will move one along its trail towards the slave. I don't want to start the slave catchers moving quite yet, so I'm going to leave this plantation here and move over here to Charleston, and it doesn't have a connection to any of the slave catcher trails. And I'm going to move from this plantation here, here into northern Arkansas. And again, that doesn't have a, a slave catcher trail connected to it. And those two moves were because of my agent's, my agent's roll card. And these actions that you can take during the action phase, you can take as it said, none of them and get money from the bank or any combination thereof or all of them if you're able to. I'm going to first spend a dollar to purchase the abolitionist card Theodore Weld. me to move one slave from any plantation to a southern space with no effect, so one of the green ovals, with no effect. So I'll take one from, I'll just take one from this plantation here, and I can move to any southern space. And I'm going to move way up here. And that is connected to the purple slave catcher trail, which means that the purple oval should move over one closer towards that slave, but because of Theodore Weld's help, the with no effect text means that that slave catcher will not activate. It also means if I were to go somewhere, and you can see that some of these have dollar signs above them, if a slave ends their turn, on one of those spots with a dollar sign, you get that amount of support in money. And if you use it, if you end up there with a with no effect card, then you do not get that money either. I've used my roll card ability. I've purchased an abolitionist card. Now I can spend one or two or none of my conductor tokens 
and then I could use my roll card special ability, but with the agent I cannot because that gets done during the planning phase. So I'm going to use one of my tokens, and these tokens, once used, they're discarded and they're out of the game. And it's three slaves, three different slaves, that can move one each. Now, like I said before, you can't just take one and move three, but if it's a different, if it's activated by a different ability on a card or a different token, you can move them again. So this one that I placed way up here, I could move it one space because that move is coming off of this token and not off of the same card or same token. And I have to be careful. We have six slaves on this market here. I have eight spaces right now, so I have enough to accommodate them. Unless some get caught and get sent to the market, then there may be more than six. But right now we're okay. And I can move three, one space. So I'm going to move this one to St. Louis with the two dollars on it. That way our agent will get two more dollars. But that's connected to the purple slave catcher trail. So he's going to leave Washington DC on a tip that he got and move one space closer towards our escaped slave. I want to draw this orange slave catcher down towards the south to keep this area fairly open. So I'm going to move for my second move from Charleston to the north in North Carolina, which will attract the attention of this slave catcher in Chicago and move him to Cincinnati. And I have one move left. And I'm going to move out of Missouri. I'm going to move into the Northern Territories in Iowa, which will give me another dollar there. But it's going to get the attention of our blue slave catcher who's going to come over to Chicago and is only a couple steps away from catching us now. I have another token. I could move some more. Let me take a look at the board and see if I want to move anybody else with the agent. I will. I'll spend my other conductor token. I'm going to move out of the plantation to there because I want to gain the attention of this slave catcher here who's going to leave New York and come down to Philly because I want to maybe start going up this East Coast route here and if I land in Boston up there and he was still in New York, it would only be one step away and he'd be able to get me right away. That was one move. I got two more. I think I'm going to draw this orange closer to the north. So we'll move here and that'll gain one dollar, but it's going to cause him to leave Cincinnati and come hang out in Chicago. Again, only one step away, but that's okay. We have one move left that we can make. I'll make a move that's not going to attract any attention. Leave the plantation and go to Charleston, South Carolina. And I think that's everything. I played my two conductor tokens. I bought an abolitionist card. I gained a benefit. I'm not going to use my one-time special ability. So that'll be it for the agent. And then I'll move us over here to the stockholder. And he's going to get a dollar at the beginning of his action phase. Once per action phase, purchase a token after taking a fundraising action. So we're going to use that to our advantage. Right now we have slaves, four escaped slaves in green spaces, so fundraising would get me four right now. But I think what I'll do is I'll make my moves first. But let me look over here and see if I want to purchase one of these first. 
Move one slave from a large northern city. I don't have anybody in a large northern city. Move two slaves, one space each, or purchase a token at a $2 discount. Or move two slaves, one space each, and purchase a token at full cost. Hmm. That's a good card, and we're going to want to use it because at the end of the turn, the last phase, in a one or two player game, the two cards that are here, if there are any here, get discarded and are out of the game. So we're going to lose it, and it's a good card since it's only a dollar to purchase it. But I have to make sure I have enough left because I want to buy a support token here. First I'll make the moves to get some more slaves into some of the green territory. So I'll use my conductor token to make three moves with three, or yes, three moves of one each with three different slaves. Let's see, I have five, six, seven. So we'll move one to that space. That yellow slave catcher is pretty far away, and this is the end of one end of his trail. So I'll use my second move there, which will attract his attention. And now I have a third move left. I could move out of here to here to give me more money, or I think what I'll do is I'll move this slave that's almost to Canada. It's up there in uh, near the border between Minnesota and Wisconsin. I'm going to take my last move into Canada because that orange slave catcher is only one space away. So if I roll poorly, I could lose somebody right when they're about to escape. So I'll go ahead and make that move into Canada and I'll place him up there as our first successful escape into Canada. Now I will use my fundraising token and for each space, each green, one, two, three, four, five, six. That'll give me six dollars in support and because of his once per action phase, purchase a token after taking a fundraising action. I'm going to spend 10 to purchase our first support token. We need one more purchased here so we can move into the next era. And for another action, I'll spend the one to purchase the card here. Move two slaves, one space each, and purchase a token at full cost. So which two do I want to move? I want to free up some room to bring more out of the plantation. Well, this one I can bring out of the plantation without attracting attention. So we'll, we'll have that slave escape into Tennessee. And any more moves that I make is going to attract some attention. So I'll move out of Arkansas into northern Missouri, and that'll gain the slave catcher's attention. And thanks to Liberty Hill, and purchase a token at full cost. So I'll spend my remaining two to purchase another conductor token that I can use in a later round. That's all I'm going to do with the stockholder. That'll finish up our action phase, moving us into the slave market phase, where the bottom card leaves the market and the six slaves that were there will go to the plantation, plantations, and these can be placed anywhere in any order that we want. I chose to place two at each plantation. Then these cards that are here, these markets get moved down. And then we will go up here 
and draw the next market, which is another seven. That's a rough one. We already have a seven on the board here. The new slave market has been populated with seven slaves. And now we will move into the final phase of the round, and that's the lantern phase. And like I said, during a one and two player game, there's a little indicator down here that lets you know that both of these, any cards here are discarded and out of the game. If it was a three and four player game, it would be just that card there. Otherwise, everything moves over to the right and we'll draw two cards from the current active time period to replace them. And we have our first opposition card. Gag rules. Players may only purchase one token during the planning phase, in effect, until removed from the queue. That stinks. And what that means is until it's removed by either purchasing it for $2 or it moving down and then being eliminated. But I don't want to wait that long because I don't want to be stuck with purchasing one token for very long. And I'll have to do that in the action phase. I'll have to buy that with somebody and get it out of there. And we get Southern Church Correspondence. If we purchase this, each player receives $2 from the bank. Right now, it wouldn't be very wise to purchase it because it costs three. So we wouldn't be making a whole lot of profit there. And that's the end of the lantern phase, except for the lead player. The lantern will move over here to the stock halter, who will go first in our second turn. Things are starting off okay. We got a support token. We need to find a way to purchase one this second turn that we can move into the next uh, time period. I think the Lane Theological Seminary says move two slaves one space or purchase a token at a two dollar discount which means it would only cost me eight so as long as I make a couple of bucks here during the action phase, I'll be able to purchase that second one with the agent during his turn. And I gotta make some money so I can get rid of these gag rules with the stockholder since he's gonna go first. We got a pretty large group of slaves that has escaped from these plantations. One has made it to Canada. The slave catchers are all moving down towards the south right now, so we got a pretty good block going. We're going to have to lure some of those away so we can find some safe passage. Our next active slave market has seven. Three, six, seven. Currently we have seven spaces, so as long as nothing gets added, we're still okay there. We won't lose any slaves, but the more we get out there, the more chances that the slave catchers will catch us and then send us to the market, which means we would be over the seven. So we also have to keep having people escape from these plantations. But that is the end of our first round. And now we will move into the second and see if we can make more progress and get some more of these slaves into the free Northern Territory. <laughs> 